Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Join us as we seek the truth and travel the long road to justice. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi flying solo. Before we get started, want to give a shout out to one of our sponsors, Two Cool T-Shirt Quilts. You can go to twocooltshirtquilts.com slash pretty lies and alibis. Check them out. We appreciate their support. So I hope you guys had a really good weekend. It was busy my way, but a good busy. And um, so I've been back and forth about this for weeks and weeks. Am I going to Crime Con? Am I not going to Crime Con? Well, finally yesterday, I decided I'm going to go to Crime Con. So I'm heading out Thursday uh, mid-morning to go to Las Vegas. And I'm really excited, y'all. I hope if anybody from you know, our crews out there, please shoot me an inbox on social media, uh, email at pretty lies and alibis at gmail.com. Let me know. Would love to meet up. There's going to be a lot of familiar faces out there. Got some really fun meetups planned. Um, also Kay and Larry are going to be out there with Nate Eaton from East Idaho news. It's just going to be a fun, fun weekend. I'm hoping to do some live streams from out there. If the internet reception is good enough, there's a lot of people going to be in Vegas, the NFL draft is right beside where I'm staying too. So that's an extra 200,000 people on the strip. Going to be insane. But if I can get some good uh, good Wi-Fi, we're going to go live. No telling who might pop up on that feed. If not, then I'll record a lot and put it on our YouTube. So, man, you know, it's kind of been a slower news day for the cases that we normally cover. But, man, this morning I read super disturbing case. This is a new case. Uh, of Lily Peters, 10-year-old girl who was found dead this morning around 9.15. Uh, police say her death is a homicide. The public may be in danger. This is near Chippewa Falls. Uh, just so if you live in the area, be vigilant. They're asking everyone to please be careful. Keep your, your eyes open. This is in Minneapolis, by the way. So she went missing last night. Uh, Actually, this is about 100 miles east of Minneapolis. I'm sorry. Her dad called 911 around 9 p.m. after she did not return home from visiting her aunt, who lived only about four blocks away. She had rode her bike there. They found her bike after dark last night near a walking trail in a wooded area, and her, her body was found close by this morning from what I've gathered. The area that she was found in is close to uh, like a brewery, and hopefully maybe there is some surveillance or something. A local on Twitter said that where she was found wasn't really a natural way from her aunt's house. So there's just a lot, a lot of questions right now. Once they found her bike, they sent canines and a drone into the woods. And uh, before they found her, police went door to door last night in the area searching for her. Um, gosh, she was in fourth grade, 10 years old. That's my daughter's age. It's just, and my daughter rides her bike. She, I tell her all the time, I'm just, you're not going to go ride around the neighborhood. And I showed her this today because 10 years old is, um, man, hopefully we get a suspect soon. It's, uh, whoever this is needs to be off the streets. There've been no arrests, but police say they are following up on, uh, multiple leads. So they're supposed to have a press conference this evening. I needed to go ahead and get this in, but if there are any updates, I'll put it on social media and then we'll talk about it tomorrow. Uh, the next bit is uh, Tammy Daybell's probate files. Uh, we took a look at those and um, just wanted to go over a few little things that were in there. Her last will and testament was dated August 3rd, 2005. I'm sorry, August 2nd, 2005. The reason I put August 3rd is that's my, my oldest daughter's birthday to the day. Uh, Chad renounced his right to be a personal representative of her estate on March 2nd of last year. Emma, their daughter, replaced him. So on the original death certificate, this is not what the FBI has found. The original death certificate lists a cardiac event as the immediate cause of death and pulmonary edema as the underlying cause of death, which is interesting because um, Alex uh, Cox, his autopsy was blood clots. Kind of, you know, you wonder if they presented the same way or something. I don't know. Uh, the estimated time of death was between midnight and 5 a.m. She was officially pronounced dead at 6.45 a.m. And as we all know, it was listed as a natural death on that death certificate. 
And we know her children, when they were interviewed for the first time, said that she died of, of asphyxiation. And uh, that's why Chad has a murder charge for her. So let's move on to Marcus Spanavello. That is the uh, ex-boyfriend of Cassie Carley, who was found dead in Alabama earlier this month after being missing. Um, the arrest affidavit was released last week. I just really didn't get a chance to go through it. It's really redacted, but there were a few little things we learned in there. He told someone who texted him to check on Carly's whereabouts that she had car issues and he gave her a ride. The report also says that he wrote they got into a verbal ar altercation and that Carly got out of his car on the side of the road and he continued home to Panama City Beach. He gave vague details to whoever he was talking to and eventually quit texting after the person was questioning what had happened. I kind of think maybe this was her dad because as we know, her dad started texting him to find out if he knew where she was. Uh, he wouldn't tell investigators where he stopped during the trip home to Panama City Beach. And he repeated the story that he told um, in the text to investigators when he spoke to them on March the 29th. So the sheriff's office was able to get surveillance video from condos and businesses in the area the night that Cassie went missing. And that has helped them to track some of his movements that night. He told investigators he had not been in her car that night, but they do have video showing he did go into her car. And if you remember, her purse was found inside that car, which is just always such a big red flag when somebody goes missing and they don't have their purse. On March 30th, investigators got an anonymous tip from someone who said Marcus told them he threw her phone out the window of his truck. So when investigators re-interviewed Marcus on March 28th, he did admit to tossing her phone. And when they asked why, he said he just didn't care about her stuff and chose to throw it out. He still hasn't been charged with her murder. He has a bond set right now of, I believe, 21000 in his court appearance, I, I just watched this. Uh, after being extradited back, he sat with his hands on his chin, just kind of like this. And he fidgeted with something in his hand. He, he looked like he was bored. And uh, he's pled not guilty to the felony charges of tampering with evidence, providing false information, and obstruction of justice. The latest charge came from him refusing to supply his DNA to investigators. Now, here's, here's the kicker. His aunt, from his dad's side, gave an interview to Channel 3, and said he's a kind man who was working hard to take care of his daughter and says he's intimate, innocent. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. He said, she said something is suspicious in the middle of the investigation. She said someone has set him up. And when asked why would anybody want to set him up? She said it's because he works all the time. He never touches anyone. He would never kill one person. He'd never do that. He's a very good boy. I know he would never kill anybody. He always work, work, work for his benefit. She said they were shocked when they saw him on the news. And uh, she said she would pay his bond. So in response, Sheriff Johnson said, no, he's not innocent. That's my response. You know, he's going to get his day in court. But I can tell you this. The evidence we have is overwhelming. He's back in court on May 5th. And uh, her autopsy was April 4th. But like I said, we still haven't heard a cause of death. They're waiting on toxicology, apparently. So hopefully we hear something in the next week or so. So Nicholas Cruz, if you guys remember, he is the school shooter that uh, shot and killed 17 of his classmates. And he pled guilty. But now they're in the penalty phase of the trial. And jury selection has been going on for two weeks. Well, we find out now they got to start all over. So ultimately, they want to pick 12 jurors and eight alternate alternates who will sit for four months and they'll decide if he gets life or death. The judge and how this came to be that they have to start over is the judge dismissed 11 potential jurors out of 60 in their group who answered no when asked if they could follow the law in this case. And she also had not asked the previous panel that question. So the defense says she should have questioned them further to see if they really meant what they said. So the prosecutors filed a motion to just start over, and the defense was not happy. They objected heavily to that, but ultimately, that's what happened. So over 1,200 potential jurors have been questioned since this started on April 4th, and of that number, 250 made it past the first round, saying they were able to sit for the four-month-long penalty phase. So what... 
what they'll do is they'll decide if the aggravating factors, such as the fact that 17 were murdered and also the fact that he planned this out, if that counter kind of outweighs the mitigating factors, which the defense is expected to talk about his lifelong mental health problems, possible fetal alcohol syndrome, and also the really premature death of his adoptive parents. So starting today, another 700 plus will be screened. So uh, Melissa McNeil, his public defender, said the judge should wait until next week to see if the 11 jurors returned. They were sent a summons and wants them questioned about their statement. They could not follow the law. And they also say, we believe you are committing more error by dismissing the potential jurors now. But the prosecution says that more time would be wasted if the potential jurors it had to be struck anyway. So ultimately, the judge sided with the prosecution, but gave the defense until Wednesday to do a little research and come back and try to change your mind. So the trial was supposed to start June 14th, but now it's been moved up a week to June 21st, expected to last well into September. So the last story today is uh, Sherry Papini. If you guys remember, we did an episode on her a few weeks back uh, in 2016. She's the one that claimed she was kidnapped by two women and held for 22 days only to find out she had been in contact with an ex-boyfriend who picked her up and helped fake her disappearance as well as inflict some of the injuries she was found with. And she pled guilty to counts of lying to a federal officer and mail fraud. Well, surprise, surprise, her husband Keith has filed for divorce. And bigger surprise, he wants sole custody of their two kids who are nine and seven. He said that she hasn't seen them in almost a month and she's already mi uh, missed one scheduled visitation with them. She had told her kids that her arrest on March 5th was a, a big mistake. And also, this is the day he filed for divorce. So he said the kids are traumatized after learning their mom lied to them for five whole years about her disappearance. Of course they are. It's insane. He said she has significant mental health issues and she is not in a position to provide good parenting to them. He's asking for all the property to be given to him, which includes their home, three cars, a motor home, and a wakeboard boat. He also wants to be free from all of her debts, including two unsecured loans from his mother-in-law and any obligations that might arise from all of her criminal behavior. Prosecutors say she planned her disappearance for up to a year, and her sentencing is set for July 11th, but originally she could have gotten up to 25 years in prison and a fine of $500,000, but prosecutors have agreed to recommend a low sentence that could be as little as 8 to 14 months. So... Yeah, I, you know, federal sentencing guidelines are confusing. We've got Josh Duggar's sentencing coming up pretty soon. And, you know, if you're a first offender, you you seem to get off pretty easy. But, man, that woman is the hot mess express. All right. Well, that's kind of the updates I have for today. Like I said, if there's any updates um, about little Lily Peters, I will put that on social media tonight. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Won't have an episode Thursday or Friday, but we're going to go live a few times from Vegas to make up for that. Should be a fun time. In the meantime, hope you guys have a good evening and we will see you tomorrow.